Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. Then today I'm truly really delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Pramod Verma, who is the Chief Architect of Aadhaar, India's digital identity program. He is also the Chief Architect for various India stack layers such as eSign, Digital Locker, Unified Payment Interface, Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture, all of which are now working at population scale in India. He has also played an integral role in architecting India's digital health infrastructure, vaccination and immunization infrastructure, and unified health interface. He is currently the CTO of Aix Step Foundation, a not-for-profit organization creating learner-centric digital public goods under Project Sunbird that powers India's largest digital learning platform called Diksha. These are used to provide learning opportunities to 200 million children and 10 plus million teachers in India and also used in other learning, skilling and capacity building efforts in India and other countries. As part of this effort, he also helped design India's digital education and skilling architecture blueprint called NDEAR. He is also the genesis author of the open source Beckin protocol that helps create decentralized open discovery, fulfillment and transaction networks. So Dr. Reilly, it's a complete pleasure and honor to have you on our humble podcast. You've been someone who's who's a pro- proponent of open source building. And, and I, I, would, I would largely first want to get your views on, you know, converging technologies. And largely the, these three, three uh, tech stacks, which I think is completely transformational and can completely upend consumers, businesses, as well as government. So these, these tech stacks which I'm talking about is Web3.0 because we trans- transitioning from Web1, Web2 and now we're going to get into Web3.0. I want to get your views on Metaverse and I want to get views on generative AI. So, but first I would like to uh, start yeah, getting your views on Web3.0 because Web3.0, the ethos says that it's decentralized, it's, it's going to be open, it's going to be distributed uh, and without a intermediary, then it's got various these substacks layers and, and things in, in it, like you know, DAOs, which is decentralized autonomous organizations, DeFi, and stuff like that. So, what are your views on, on this tech stack, and how do you think it's going to impact society and the world? Um, it's a little bit, Web3 has been, you know, I think it's one of those uh, <laughs> in the ter- terms that got created. Uh, a little bit hyped up, I think, uh, you know, but it's a transition. Frankly, I'm a computer scientist and I, you know, I've seen from late 80s <laughs> in every possible programming language to computer systems and architectures that is uh, evolving. And um, for me, Web3 is a natural progression. That is not, frankly, it is nothing that big except when it comes to the decentralized ledger. I think the idea of the decentralized ledger uh, created quite an interesting possibility. Frankly speaking, that paper that came out originally and subsequently Bitcoin and Ethereum and you know, so many of them now, now. And also the consensus protocol. By the way, consensus protocols existed before. Uh, the idea uh, of any distributed system. So if you pe- people like us who study computer science who looks at uh, distributed computing uh, have dealt with consensus. Uh, when you create large scale, uh, you know, distributed components, they all need to, you know, collaborate and collaborate and say who is the leader, who will say vote for this, and who will be okay because there are some. Sometimes you have right turn conflicts and read conflicts and so on. So if somebody has to resolve them. So the con- consensus argument. Uh, protocol or consensus algorithms existed before but the, that plus the immutable ledger uh, created a very interesting tech possibility let me put it that way it created a very interesting tech possibility but you know humans have created society as an organized society systems uh, to deal with such complexity, although we, you know, all the systems are in one sense, not perfect. There's nothing perfect about it, whether it's a government, you know, property registration department, should there be a property registration department or no? All these are extreme questions, you know, I'm not an expert in some of those 
societal implications to those questions. But I, I suppose uh, we have created those structures to be able to attest, uh, create trust. So for example, if I register my property and if you're buying my property, we will look at the property registry and say, okay, this is a proper property. But, you know, frankly speaking, it's just a, just one artificially created entity and a database maintained, ledger maintained by that department. Uh, so I think Web3 also brought all kinds of interesting questions. Should those entire idea of currency, entire idea of central bank, entire idea of, uh, you know, current government and systems. So, you know, I, I've also seen in Web3 as yes, group of people who went extreme and to say everything will change, you know, government will collapse and new set of formal, new ways of governing the society will happen. Now, for me, this will never happen um, just because tech guys push for some tech, okay? It'll happen like a French Revolution or anything in the history. It'll happen when the society as a whole is ready for it and the want a change in the larger structural changes. And these changes are never happening. You know, they happen, they brew and brew and systematically happen. You know, it might look like happening to immediately, but it doesn't happen over time, overnight. So what happened though with Web3 is that the hype combined with a little bit of extremism um, took us towards you know, um, and, and combine the third element of Web3, very important. Although, you know, you brought, you brought an interesting point about decentralize everything. I, my argument, my, when I, as a computer scientist, I would argue that no, we are not decentralizing power. We are not decentralizing uh, platform plays. We are decentralizing ledger. That's fine. That, you know, sort of understand that. For example, you know, if you want an NFT trading platform or NFT generation and trading platform, it'll become no different from an eBay or a you know large marketplace monopolized by the market player in one sense, where both consumers and uh, suppliers of NFT, NFT or you know digital assets uh, stay there. The underlying asset may be on the ledger, but the transactions occur. In, on a platform which is no different from Web2, frankly speaking. Because the Web2's issue has been also that the platform uh, platforms dominated, you know, Amazons and Webs, you know, Ubers and you know, Ebays and all these platforms create double-sided marketplace or iTunes store or anything, right? Anything that you have looked at. Uh, they all create a supply and demand together on a platform and tries to, you know, um, try to gain market share and try to create a dominant, uh, uh, you know, play, I become a dominant player. Web3 is no different. So Web3 was hype plus a little bit of extremism combined with a glorified platform play really meant that it was bound to hit the wall in one sense. And this is exactly what happened. If you go travel to Valley, I don't think people are talking Web3 much because they, they're also starting to backpedal a little bit to say, and also the FTX collapse and all this stuff has not helped. But there is still something interesting in it. I think that technology is like that never goes away fully. You know, they would go round and round and round and round and there'll be a time when something very, very interesting will happen. And we have just had to wait for that, you know, to happen. And it won't be... a uh, big, you know, this is, you know, Web3 went through the, exactly what the initial first wave of internet uh, uh, companies went through the f before the first internet collapse. Everybody is starting a dot-com boom, as they call it, dot-com boom, is exactly what repeated in Web3, but doesn't mean internet went away. It doesn't mean anything went away. We are all on the internet even today, right, in that sense. So, I think Web3 some of the technological, you know, underpinnings of Web3 will continue to play out. I think it will play out and come back. So I think it's important that we don't overdo, especially in the early phases of uh, technology. And that's a great learning from there. And the same thing will happen in AI and same thing will happen everywhere, right? There'll be early cycles of 
um, you know, massive, you know, all, you know, hype and everything created around it because venture capital want funding, startups want to do it, but it will come to a little bit of a, you know, difficult time. And then the good part of it will remain and it will come back. I think that's what's happening to everybody. Right. But interesting technology though, you know, there are definitely very valuable, the non-immutable, the immutable ledger, uh, the idea of that is very, very powerful, frankly speaking, for any uh, multi-party uh, trust establishment of sort, right? If you if you want to call, I would still look for good opportunities to bring in ledger tech, but remove the scale part of it. You know, the scale of ledger has been, you know, today, for example, UPI, we do 8 billion transactions. There's no way you can do UPI on a ledger, frankly speaking, because, you know, just volumes are way too crazy. Other, we do 1.5 billion transactions a month. So what kind of ledger can we actually, you know, scale? But that, that's computer scientists, scientists will solve. They'll solve the tech uh, scaling part, uh, and then some good part will remain, and it'll, I think it'll be used. I think it'll be used in interesting ways that we may not be imagining today. Right. Yeah. I, I think we sitting in exciting point of time where these tech stack, like you rightfully pointed out, has been unfortunately forced onto people and organizations. You know, when it kind of merges in well, where the consumers and businesses are seeing real world value, I think that's when these tech stack will will fuse into our daily lives in a way where we will not even call it technology, yes. but it'll be just a tool which will be enhancing our lives, whether yes. as a consumer or, or as businesses. And you rightfully pointed out, you know, there are these tech maximalists who are trying to, you know, push drive a, a certain conversation. And that's the reason, I mean, we saw the FTX collapse. I think it, it needs to fuse. And yes, there are some really, really cool ethos of, of web trio you know yeah. uh, uh when it does when it does get implemented I, i'm sure i mean it, it could be a, a complete game changer on how we live work and play and we may not even call web3 as you said very rightly said technology ceased to become technology frankly speaking what's not tech you know roads are tech railways is tech everything you see is actually tech Technology in that sense, but we stop calling them technology because they're so fused into society, right? Right. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm gonna I mean talk about a little bit of these these two really hyped word. One is the metaverse, and metaverse. one is AI and ge yeah. gen generative yeah. AI. Now, now the, the the metaverse, the metaverse, I think is gonna uh, it's 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 really big, though it's really really hyped, and it's still not there. It, it it's it's termed to be the future of the internet, and it's said. I mean, you know, people, the leaders in the space believe that we will transition from a two D. Uh, flat uh, interfaces into the 3D world and, and plus it will take or it'll change your interfaces also you know right from possibly moving from a, like how we transition from a computer to a phone eventually we'll move from uh, carrying technology to possibly wearing technolo technology maybe like a head wearable device where the entire world is is is, is a screen it'll be immersive it'll be interactive now with metaverse this this one term which is being used or thrown too much in interoperability now when it, when it comes to interoperability i mean you you have like really taken it somewhere else with upi now with metaverse you know because most of these web2 companies i mean wouldn't want their assets their businesses to go going to other or, or platform how does interoperability play out digital identity play out in the metaverse uh, layer and what could be the economic layer of the metaverse frankly speaking the identity layer or economic layer will not be, according to me, will not be any different from, I mean, there'll be some difference, but there won't be any drastically different from what we are seeing today. Except that the experience layer would have transformed itself to much more immersive, much more um, high fidelity of experience that we would do but that as a human being as we experience normally, right? We have multiple sensory inputs coming through. We filter it out. We focus on a few things. That's what happens in real world. And then suddenly the computer is sort of 2D with an artificial keyboard, which is thankfully almost gone with touch now. But 
imagine keyboard and the screen was so artificial in one sense <laughs> you know but that is was the starting point i suppose and then again but though it is i have programmed in 96 i was actually coding using vr technology on the browser we were experimenting w3c had a very good uh, you know a team who was working on uh, virtual reality within html right because html became the language of the web std became the protocol of the web and then anything that html brought in had a much wider acceptance so they were trying and then all of us were i, I was uh, into in teacher and i always thought yeah as a, as a teacher imagine you could create simulations i could create this and that but what what was difficulty though is that sometimes it's just not ready in terms of availability of devices at on at the common man level in the sense that a billion can a billion people have devices to experience it second bandwidth consumed consumed for to experience such high fidelity real time experience the cost of various electronics and various other projection technologies maturity of that and cost of that third and fourth is the computing and availability of compute computing power a distributed computing power may not be all centralized 94 was you know if you look back it, the laptops there doesn't didn't even have a tiny smartphone capability and then it was just smartphones today carry nearly the mainframes of the 80s right that kind of uh, 80s 90s computing power so because of the moore's law we are compressing the computing into the hands of the people which is what happened with smartphone but smartphone is still 2d but still nevertheless we managed to take a computer to every person literally i mean we i mean on the way let's say another fast forward another five six years 2030 you look back you'll see pretty much everyone having a computing device with them they become the agent through which they interact with the rest of the world right today's a smartphone that becomes my agent that's the only thing i don't leave anyway right in one sense if you it's funny that you leave your child you leave your everybody but except your smartphone you know you take it everywhere you go which is a good thing which, which given the computing given the bandwidth given the dramatic change and enhancement in technology projection technology and so on we are gradually we, we were always going towards this but we will never reach there is the argument i would make so drawing a line in 2017 or 18 just because facebook renamed to meta and started talking about zuckerberg talk, talking about metaverse doesn't mean anything is going to happen in, in the next these guys have been imagining ar vr technology for the last 20 years you know so it has been 20 this technology is continuous it's a continuum where you will see immersion happening one step at a time and you will keep on happening 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 when you look back in 2014 some of us maybe old 2050 sitting back you say oh my god this is crazy no we, we have we don't have phones anymore or we have embedded in your ear inside you know it's a tiny chip when you just like staple it or whatever and then you're connected but it will be a gradual thing it will never never society will not again accept anything that jerky Second, as human being, as biological, we have a limit of our input processing power. What was it done? Which is why 3D movies started in 1920s. No, whatever, right? The original black and white was the early Charles Bronson movie, I think. It was the first 3D movie or something in the Hollywood, which was I think, House of Wax. I think the original House of Wax. <laughs> I think that was a 3D. But people never took it. Even with Avatar coming in, People find that intensity of that input is so crazy that people say, whoa, I can only deal with this for a short period of burst. Otherwise, I, you know, this is, this is too much uh, sensory overload for me to deal with as a brain, right? I mean, which is correctly so. Which is the same reason why when you are on front of a smartphone or a you know, device for five, six hours, 
your brain will try itself and say go sleep or take break and so on so as a biological being our limits will come so the two things are going to happen one point on whatever it one it always existed my argument it was always there ar we are at various so it's a continuum you can't draw a line saying we are in whatever no no we always been and we'll always be but with no end to it okay that's how you want to see a continuum with no end to it second human beings will find it very very hard to what you call process sensory inputs beyond a particular uh, you know so i think it would always be according to me somewhat limited because beyond that it will be look like a smartphone addiction or anything else it look like beyond that it will be a very difficult as a societal biological you know being it will be very difficult so i think maybe you will watch tv by wearing a glass like this and sitting and think sure yeah i mean it's a bound to happen you know just pretty state forward right this is why movies imagine people like you <laughs> who are non tech folks in the media world will you know you can easily imagine that thing of course this is going to happen but today's google glass or something might look funky clunky you know a little bit weird it's not obvious privacy is not obvious what happens if everybody is recording me you know it's not obvious so society will play out very very carefully and eventually but i think we will have definitely entertainment devices that are embedded literally near your uh, brain rather than far on a 2d screen uh, it's going to happen but i think we'll limit ourselves so my my take to you would be it's always been there it's a continuum with no end and i think human beings and society will resist uh, all out metaverse experiences right so so i i i take two very profound thing that you know technology is, is continuum you know we always see technology as okay this is what is going to be there and when it comes is going to change your life yeah. but i think it's always a continuum and there'll be small small iteration where it it will keep on changing and maybe adding more dynamics to the tech stack making it more accessible and more uh, a, a possibly yeah. like an enjoyable ex experience and you mentioned about sensory overload i think you know today we live in a world i think we've been thrown uh, or you know with this uh, thrown in this world with so much of data you know and so much of data overload my 7 and 1/2 year old son is hooked onto the computer and sometimes i feel what part of it is right and what part of it is wrong you know because they, 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 so so these obviously these are these questions i think we need to ask ourselves but there's one thing which is extremely interesting which is played out is that you know post covid everything which is tech has kind of accelerated possibly 10 or 15 years into the future so what we thought would possibly take maybe like 15 years time has kind of like come to us in a very very small margin what could be a balanced society you know because we all, i think all are asking this question specifically in a day and time like today where these tech stack is converging and it's like almost like taking over our lives even the governments i mean you know, nations are trying to leverage uh, a, a tech to the advantage so that they can you know be uh be one step uh, up from uh, you know another nation now th there are you know tech tools such as uh, stable diffusion which is giving you text to image then there is text to video then there is chat gpt which is completely yeah. upended the world you know in 5 days it, yeah. it, it reached 5 million users so this generative ai stack these large language models what we doing is we are also automating our cognition you know what once was human what we used to do <laughs> design writing you know coding we are giving it away to uh these machines and this is 2023 so in your views who's some who's be somebody who's been invested in tech and understand technology in such a deep deep way is is this something which worries you or are you excited by it would love to hear your thoughts on this what yeah. would happen maybe 15 years in the future or 20 years in the future so i in general my um emotion is about excitement in general emotion is excitement because i think it's not because the tech has come what did smartphone do smart what did internet is it internet democratized access to information I mean, when Google search came, you are, everybody has the same information. So only motivation and intent is left. You know, you and I otherwise we'll have the same. Everybody will have the same information on their fingertips. 
when with smartphone you have the computing power in your hand now not everybody can leverage it uh, understandably so education levels economic background you know uh, we should not take it for granted that everybody is like us I and mean, you know there will be a difference in the way uh, people leverage it but it democratized computing is democratized through smartphone similarly when it comes to uh, metaverse the excitement for me is about democratizing the best learning or best access to healthcare or best agriculture information presented to me and helping me out if these if these technologies can truly empower the every individual out there then technology at large would have done better in a good thing to the human society than a bad thing but quite like any technology all technologies like knife you know when we started fire or knife you can use fire to burn someone or you know knife to kill someone or knife to do something cook or knife to you know cut grass or do some farming and tools and so on so in general humans use for at, at large scale human use it for the good goodness of society and their own their own uh, you know progress you know life progress but there is always every technology will also have a negative effect and it has to be carefully analyzed because if negative effects overweigh the positive effects, we are doomed because technology cannot be stopped you cannot stop technology at all so if you start bio you know democratizing biology democratizing uh, you know edit dna editing and so on and if if everybody can create variants of species in their home and then we don't know what are the ripple effect of some of these going to be right you know some completely freaky mosquito you know being created or something right i mean these are very much possible if with technology that's a funny thing and so i think it is we have to be as a society we have to debate that very very loud and clear about at what point in time what is okay what's responsible ai mean what does responsible use of tech mean what is the you know bounding conditions that bind you know put some sort of boundary of it's to make sure the adoption is slow steady consistent towards a larger you know value systems that all of us hold you know society but moderation is another fear so the one is a tech doing harm that means an ai incorrectly predicting incorrectly doing healthcare uh, you know and, and and people start believing right computer you know told me you know i don't know why the computer is telling me computer is telling me to do so if you start giving up our agency to the computer and say computer told i have no idea why you see you are predicted to be a criminal then so we are in minority report right so we have to be in a very very um, cognizant of where are we going to use ai and what part of that is going to be used or metaverse or anything for that matter but ask this question does that truly help the last person on the road or does it help few large companies that's a good question to ask second do we have good you know explainability and good um, rules of the game responsible delivery responsible delivery of such technology Uh, do we have that in play? Do, have we thought about it as a society? Third, do we have bound, bound, bounding conditions like legal protection? You know all that thing surrounding any technology. We need all these three to come. But the fourth most important is an individual's own use or overuse of technology, which is not different from overeating. Uh, just because McDonald's showed up in the town doesn't mean you eat twice a day. i mean just because you can eat packaged food doesn't mean you keep eating so i think these are self moderation that you can game yourself whole day you can play game in the computer but would you would you want to would you want your child to do i mean it's very very important that moderation has nothing to do with technology moderation is key to life actually i i am a practicing guy who moderates a lot of things in my life and it's nothing to do with food it's to do with a little bit of walking little bit of going out seeing people and also using technology so that is but not to be imposed it is a self awareness problem of how people can 
say, you know, I'm moderating everything. So then if you have these four things coming together, hopefully the rollout of these technologies are not to be afraid, rather uh, to be used to truly help the farmer to the last patient who has no, today has no access to healthcare, or to, to the child who is a first generation learner in the family, wanting to learn good stuff, why would they not be given the best experiences and best uh, you know, uh, access to knowledge and opportunities uh, provided we have good rules of responsibility and accountability well understood, rules of the game well understood, and everybody moderates technology or anything. You know, why technology? General moderation of anything you do. Right. Yeah. So I I take this from you very that moderation is, is the key. But I think you know I mean the world always lives on the left or the right side. You know I think that the truth is somewhere in the middle. And you know the, you yeah it, it's I, I guess yeah that's what I take from this this, this conversation. Uh, I, I had the you know privilege of speaking to Shankar Maruwada uh, on, okay. on the on the podcast uh, you know some time back. And and you you part of uh, Extra Foundation. You're the CEO. Then you're also uh, responsible for the endear uh, blueprint. So, uh, healthcare and uh, uh, education, the, the, these two, uh, I mean, are, are so core to you know, I mean, well-being of a nation. Uh, how do you think you know tech is going to play a role over there? And and please talk a little bit about your works in Extra Foundation. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, how does tech play in healthcare or education? And I, you know, I get asked this question. If you put together a digital healthcare architecture in this country, does that actually, does that guarantee, does that solve our healthcare problem? And my answer almost always is a very, probably not going to solve you know, all the problems we have. Because we have seen educated people with money so educated, well-to-do people screwing up their health. So I, you know, so it will be very, very interesting to ask a larger questions later. But I ask a reverse question. As a technologist, I ask reverse question. You know, as Henry Ford once said, you know, if you teach your employee, uh, if you train your employees, uh, you know, they might leave. But that's better than not training your employees and having them stay. <laughs> you know, untrained employees with you. So it. it you know, it's one of those what's called a necessary condition. It's important to understand. Not giving identity, not giving bank account, not giving opportunity to learn, not giving opportunity to be healthy is not a choice. We must ensure everybody has that. That does not guarantee the outcome. It's very, very important. So as a technologist, I look for what's called necessary condition to be satisfied, but not sufficient condition. Sufficiency, I don't know, because we don't know, even if everybody has access to healthcare and everybody is well-to-do and affordable healthcare, will they be healthy? That I don't know, okay, frankly, because it is so much to do with human uh, behavior, uh, you know, your own, you know, understanding of how to do, live a good life, you know, your own cultural habits and family habits, so much to do with everything else that will we have a healthy society but not giving healthcare not giving affordable and accessible healthcare is a disaster guarantee so not giving is a disaster but giving it doesn't mean everybody will be healthy and you know well off and all that thing okay so that's my take so my as a mathematician i think like this i think what are the necessary conditions that we must fulfill anyway you know not building highways is not a choice we have to build highways Right, we have to connect the countries and so on. But you will have after connecting the highway, you don't know whether they'll use it for their economic one. Will they drive sensibly? Will they drive wear their seat belts? Or will they, you know, they'll drive right opposite in one way? We don't know all this behavior. We have seen it in all kinds of madness going on. But nevertheless, not doing is not an option. So I would always argue point number one: what we are doing in education and healthcare is trying to provide that necessary condition, a set of digital building blocks that addresses the necessary condition towards affordability, access 
access to learning opportunities, access to job opportunities, access to our access to healthcare and access to you know uh, wellness opportunities and healthcare opportunities. Affordability is the next one. Even though I have access to a hospital nearby, if it's not affordable, then you know it's it's uh, unfair at large. At large, you know, 80, 90 percent of the country should have 100 percent. is always difficult to predict. But definitely, majority of the people should have affordable, accessible healthcare or education opportunities. So, what does tech do? Go back to the original point we were talking about, conversing earlier. Tech allows democratization, and tech allows friction removal. Tech allows asymmetry removal, whether it's information asymmetry or whether anything else removal. And we have seen that happening every time with internet and Google search and everything else. It systematically is like a Tetris game at the bottom gets collapsed and democratized you know so i think it is bound to happen so we we'll, we will we are always looking for technology that solves or help with affordance and affordability and access to opportunities access to opportunity to for healthcare education so on and technology as a democratizing factor and technology as a power to the people factor so I used how can we handle this power, give this power back to the individual so that they can make the right decision using the technology, maybe technology enabled, maybe the language enabled. Like I can speak Hindi on a you know chat GPT interface, for example, today on a WhatsApp board. And actually, do I know? Uh, can I get better opportunity for jobs nearby or anything, you know, things like that? So we look we, for us, we look for that kind of thing. That's what we always look at. And at Extra Foundation, primarily Extra Foundation was set up to um, uh, provide education, learning opportunities to 200 million children. And that means pretty much still the most of until high school, the you know, the primary and the middle school. That's what we focused on. But as part of the Diksha rollout and subsequently now, you know, Diksha is all the government project. It is owned and operated by the government. Uh, but the much of the work we did at Extra Foundation also became open source. Everything is in the open source. So we work on uh, learning uh, technologies. We work on knowledge management technologies. We work on credentialing, such as COVID certificate, verifiable credentials, as we call it. Things that I can prove that I'm a carpenter. I can prove that I have five years experience. I can prove that I had... 4.8 rating as a driver in Uber and so on, right? It's important. I think we have to give that power back to the people, their ability to prove they are a good, skilled worker. Instead of we trusting no one. Today, that's what we do. We have a low trust, high cost environment. We should reverse it to a high trust and low cost environment. So we work on these technologies in addition to schooling. So because these technologies are, and we also work on Indic languages, we had significant work with IIT Madras uh, AI for Bharat team. Uh, and you might have seen the latest, some news about chat GPT being used in the government and so on uh, with IIT Madras. That's effort because we are looking at how can our Indic language, you know, um, AI, Indic language AI, which is speech, text to speech, text to text and all that can be leveraged, but connect to the language models like GPT and chat GPT. How can we now create, remove even further friction for the farmer for accessing knowledge and products and services or government benefits? So we were looking at four things. How can we remove or five things? Okay, these are very, very five key things to democratize. Information asymmetry. We have to remove information asymmetry and make sure everybody has very quickly using their language, voice being a natural interface rather than a keyboard or typing interface, you know, can they speak and get all the knowledge that they have fingertips? So knowledge asymmetry is one. The second one is the, um, uh, what you call products and services asymmetry. This is very important. Access to products and services. Do they know what product is good for them? What investment product? Should I invest a little bit here? Should I save it in an FD? Should I do this? Should I do? Now, these are very, very high friction, big asymmetry going on today. Uh, so, to, for example, if I can get lending today, most people get lending from a money lender, you know, where because formal systems are inaccessible to them. And that's very, very unfair. So that is the second part, the products and services. The third part is opportunity. 
job opportunity, selling, buying opportunity. If I'm a farmer, do I get the best opportunity to sell my produce? If, I, if I'm a, you know, a doctor sitting, do I get the best opportunity to provide a telemedicine offering to someone, right? Uh, if I'm a student, do I get the best internship opportunity? Maybe I'm a gifted child, but I'm from a tier two, tier three town. And suddenly I'm not networked enough, like the way urban guys are networked enough. And then I don't get opportunities, maybe a brilliant opportunity in you know, Bangalore or Delhi or Mumbai, an internship opportunity. Today, this is complete fragmentation, right? So the third is the uh, opportunity uh, asymmetry that we have to remove, job, internship, you know, business opportunities and so on. Fourth is government, lot of government scheme. India it continues to be a large, uh, you know, government schemes are meant to power people who deserve to get it. Uh, but the people who deserve to get it don't know about the schemes, you know, most of the time, unless some big scheme. Of course, PDS, like food, ration shop, and all that thing has been there for multiple decades. NREG has been there for some time. Those few big national schemes, they know. But there are like 1,500, 2,000 schemes in the, across the central and state governments, including state and central government. But nobody, they keep on launching schemes. They don't actually, very difficult for it to disseminate to all the way, right? So that is another one. So there is an area where our focus is that how can we make sure this entitlement programs and so on and money kept aside genuinely reaches the poor. Now everybody has a bank account, thanks to Aadhaar and thanks to, uh, you know, Jandhan and so on. Everybody can now get money. Uh, but the question is, what are they, what is the right, uh, you know, uh, what you call scheme I have? Maybe a, I'm a, girl who is studying in eighth standard and you know rural environment maybe there's a scholarship that was meant for me i would have never known unless some ngo or some government officer or somebody happened to tell me really otherwise i won't come to know at all so uh, it's important that we remove these asymmetries that's precisely what look at tech and that's what exactly what exa foundation we have been doing is to put out a lot of these open source building blocks that can cut across education, skilling, and sometimes in healthcare. By the way, COVID, uh, the part of COVID which produced that verifiable credential was the Sunbird business, uh, Sunbird building block uh, that came out of Excel work. So it's reusable. Basically, it's a set of reusable building blocks. Uh, but again, goes back to the primarily fundamental idea. I think it's about what can we do to take tech to the people? and truly remove this asymmetry and provide as much opportunity does not mean outcome will be guaranteed okay let me put it that way <laughs> very clearly yeah but not <laughs> doing it is a disaster not having a plumbing and pipeline to the house is a disaster having pipe will you get good water will you drink water regularly and i don't know all that thing will happen <laughs> yeah. right now with it you know from Aadhaar, upi coven uh, extra foundation now you you have put together back in back in protocol would you like to talk a little bit about it yeah so uh, the, we spoke about opportunity asymmetry in that four asymmetries i talked about opportunity asymmetry right opportunity asymmetry is because uh, a classic example of that is a, an, i am an sme i am a small shop owner i can sell but the only people who know about me are the people who has lived right nearby or has gone by my shop and seen something. Very, very, very small people. But what has technology done? Technology has removed distance. At the end of the day, it's disconnected internet. Remove that distance. Today, you can do video conference anybody, anywhere in the world. Why can't then be I be discovered? And my products and my shop be discovered and I can't order. Today, they can't because they have two prob problems they face. One, the lack of um, technology or ca capability that they, they don't know what to do and all that thing. Second, they, have, they are subservient to a marketplace. That means if they list themselves in Amazon, they will hopefully get some orders through Amazon if I have good rating and so on. Or if I list myself in eBay or some other places like that, Amazon and Flipkart and so on. But that's pretty much left, left with it. Now think, now repeat the same question again. What if I'm a plumber? Very good plumber. 
But how do I know I'm even very good? First of all, nobody knows I'm a very good plumber other than people who have interacted with me, which is a handful. But I may be idling, but there might be a person who wants plumbing nearby. Today, how do we solve that asymmetry? Opportunity asymmetry, discovery asymmetry is again, we try to put a platform in the middle and say, maybe you register with urban company and urban company definitely does a good job and train you and hopefully you'll get it. But the problem is that you are now only left with urban company giving you orders. What happens? But I, I am the service provider. I am the good plumber. Urban company is the good plumber, right? So it's important that I get opportunities from anywhere. Not only through one company. Because if your sales channels, you know, if your sales channels are only one company is giving you deals, you have to be afraid. One of these days, if they shut off that pipe, your life is gone, right? This is why many companies want multiple sales, uh, you know, uh, doors open because you know just one customer i have all my business with one customer is all bad business anyway so because same reason same same basics now you do the same with the teacher or doctor so you will see the same pattern repeating today we see that with uber and so on right uber is one of the models that you know it changed our way we imagined our when uh, what was that and when uber launched for smartphone Booking and seeing the cab coming nearby was an experience that it was crazy for us first time when you experienced it. And you would never want to go back. But the problem with that platform model was that we were left with just Uber. And the problem was that, that, that they would take 30% from the driver or even higher. In San Francisco, I heard they go up to 50, 55% commission. And you know, when the broker takes that kind of commission, in one sense, intermediary takes commission. The power is taken away from the driver and from the consumer, and the platform accumulates such large power, it somewhat backfires. You know, it's not an argument against capitalism, and it's a good thing because without Uber, we would have never imagined it. But when only one company is left, the society, uh, you know, you know, sort of uh, rebels back which is what we see with Indian drivers or even most of European countries. You go, you will see significant pushback against Uber. Indian countries, of course, the driver will say, how much is he showing you? Sir, 1,200, okay, cancel it. I'll come and pay me directly. <laughs> Basically, all drivers are the guard in India. They have figured it out that I'll just ask you how much your Uber is showing you and then I'll just cancel the ride and I'll come straight. And you pay me through UPI <laughs> straight away, no problem. You know, right? why pay the commission? But no, there is a value, right? Platform is providing discoverability. So we were asking the question, if this fragmented plumbers and in doctors and teachers and of course, Kirana shop, um, you know, homestays. Today, if you have a homestay in Goa, how do I find it? Make my trip, maybe. Airbnb, maybe. But that's it. There's no other way to discover, but that's unfair, right? They might be very, very interesting. But the other ways to find it is some friends and family. You know, somebody will say, oh, I went there and stayed in Kunur. Why didn't you try this? Why didn't you try that? that? But that is not in the information era, in the internet era of everything being connected. It is unfair to leave those small businesses and a business of one, which is like a plumber and driver, you know, business of one, literally one person, two people businesses without them having to leverage the connectivity and information asymmetry which internet ought to solve. So we said, no, post-platform era, we have to move towards a network era, decentralized network era, but we cannot be the owners of network. We can't be running one network, you know, better Uber network, you know, that would look like, why is it different? So we worked on an underlying thing. What did we ask the first principle question? What did HTTP do and HTML do? HTTP and HTML allow if you, you already have a blog, I have, I have an Ubuntu machine, neither of us have to depend on anybody. I can actually just read your blog, I can watch your videos and so on, right? So it, it allowed peer-to-peer -peer information exchange, discovery and information exchange, HTTP and HTML. So similarly, that's what we did with backend protocol. Backend protocol we created 
decentralized protocol, a protocol like HTTP, that and HTML, a language like HTML that allowed commerce di discovery. So you can discover providers and service providers on one side, consumers can discover and directly engage them without a platform in the middle. Uh, but for that, you need to have the same language of business. When I say invoice, when you say price, I have to know that it's the same thing. So in the computer terms, you have to create a semantic language to do that. That's what Beckham Protocol was all about. It is a completely an open source effort, uh, thousand plus uh, developer community already uh, going global now. But India has been experimenting with two networks, uh, primarily using Beckham Protocol. One is called ONDC, which is an open network for digital commerce which is primarily bringing e-commerce to the decentralized e-commerce, think of that way. And uh, we are also doing both in Kerala and Bangalore, we have, they have launched uh, Yatri, the world's first taxi booking without an intermediary in one sense, taxi order to charge. Now Kochi, by the way, Metro ticketing and all you can do on backend. Metro, you can buy any app, you can use it to buy any ticket of any um, Metro taxis, you know, auto rickshaws are joining and private buses are joining. So Kochi expanded to Kerala. They are expanding to all over Kerala now. And Bangalore launched something called Namayatri, which is using the same thing, where 30,000 auto rickshaw drivers have joined uh, the network because they feel it's my auto rickshaw and you are the consumer and you can discover me digitally. I should be able to, you know, offer you and get all the money. Maybe there is a small convenience fee by the tech provider because auto rickshaw drivers are not writing their own app because that's not what is expected. So some tech tech startup would provide some tech support and uh, app for the to accept them to see monthly billing or you know say like my khata book type of situation, right? I need a small app, but that should not be fifty percentage of your charges commission. You know that's the real good. So they might say hundred rupees you know, a day or 50 rupees a day, because if you're making 500, 600 rupees or 1000 rupees for a discovery and fulfillment with the like Uber, like experience, if I can give you 50 rupees, it's not so bad. I keep get to keep everything, right? As an auto rickshaw driver. So because of that in Bangalore, auto rickshaw drivers are telling the consumers, Namma means mine in Bangalore, Canada. So they say Namma, this Namma app, it's my app. You know, so use it so that you can give pay me and you know, it's all between us. Uh, so world's first peer-to-peer, -peer, permissionless mobility network. It's how, very, very interesting. <laughs> how cool is that? You know, I mean, I, I think the entire business, how we transact and engage is going to get completely upended. Balaji Srinivasan had, had written a yeah. book called The Network State, you know, and, yeah. and uh, Decentralized Network. I, I think it, it's going to completely change uh the world uh my last question to you i wish i had maybe the full day with you you know because we didn't speak too much about Aadhaar card and you uh, what what would be your advice to students and businesses uh you know entrepreneurs that's my first question you you could address you know when beckon protocol becomes more democratized more accessible more and more people get to know how would businesses look that's my second question and my third question what type of businesses you see surviving and thriving with this tech disruption underway and the changing dynamics of consumer demands wow that's heavy question okay so first one i am actually nobody to advise i think students are much smarter today and they understand what's going on uh, but the only advice is be very, very, always be a learner. I think three things I always tell youngsters, including my daughter, would say, never stop learning. Constantly learn and be curious. That being curious is such a natural human thing. If you can cultivate being curious, you would do an amazing job. Point number one. Point number two, respect and collaborate. You know, respecting other people's opinion, understanding they are coming from a different background, different reason, different care. You know, they are not idiots. Other people are not idiots. They have a point of view. So respecting other point of view and listening carefully and collaborating is such a power to you, frankly, it's not for other person. 
frankly you do a much better job the third second one third definitely don't be afraid to be adventurous and dream big so i think if if you if you do these three things students can do absolute magic in their life in their own life doesn't mean they will become elon musk or anything but even then being curious being collaborative and being a you know, shameless dreamer the sense that think big these three can take you a lot of places it's not about getting better marks and get your iit marks or entrance marks it's not at all that in fact these three things all matters and being curious and learnable all the time and collaborating all the time and actually just thinking big and you'll be surprised how much a small individual or few people can do in this country so that's first part to advise to the students yeah second part what comes in what is the you know sort of future look like i think future would look like you know is again it's a bad idea to predict the future anyway uh, and i'm nobody to predict the future but i would think if you simply plot where we are going we would be extremely digitized that be digital is in everything you do in life so digital you know sme you know managing inventory paying salary going there going coming here buying ticket going to a show buying ticket or you know buying gift everything will be di digital enabled so digital will be everywhere point number 1 point number 2 you even even though we believe we are connected we will be even more connected so connect connecting doesn't mean telco connection i didn't mean telecom can be connected digitally connected that means you would be you know chatting with a bot as if you are chatting with somebody else you know and you would be you know immersed in the through experiences uh, that would be that would feel you more closer and connected to people and locations i might you know i might have been sitting in your room today at uh, 10 years later if you are doing this i might have been as well in your studio you know even though not physically so that experience so we will be more and more fused and connected with both information and people so we have to figure out how that will leverage and the most importantly i hope that this dissemination of this technology the highly hyper connected the highly digital experiences would actually be given the agency and choice and the empowerment of that large individual if it is used by few people and few companies a uh, few intellectuals like us or few uh, companies it will be a disaster because we would use that to the power to take power and not give power so i think we should always look at technology to democratize so i think that was something which i hope that's what beckens effort was also beckens to effort if that sme is going to be everything digital if that sme has the opportunity to do a good job that sme should be connected to the grid you know the grid is about now suddenly people can discover them people can give jobs to them all digitally who knows with metaverse and so on a nurse sitting here could be perfectly helping an old person in japan you know 20 30 years later right so we have a very young educated population if they can be hyper connected well educated and give opportunity to them we could be seeing very good magic i think beckens effort was precisely to create a network centric connectivity rather than everybody being on one platform platform centric connect connection so i hope that's that and third what did you ask on the third question what was uh, what was the businesses or the future going to look like with the changing uh, yeah, think, dynamics yeah. of consumers yeah i think that's no different frankly it's not different from businesses that face internet businesses that face internet crash businesses that faced 20 you know 2611 then is been faced uh, rise again and then the cloudification of everything and then smartphone launch that re, you know forced everybody to reimagine everything from a, including google search frankly right the only reason uh, sundar pichai is up there is because of his success in android i heard so it's because if that didn't exist the search in google now again the chat gpt is there again uh, reimagining what would happen right so i think technology would keep coming and then again lehman brothers kind of economic uh, and war 
like situation, humans are notorious. I think we'll keep screwing around with stuff and climate, potential climate crisis, floods and un uncontrolled weather and so on. It's going to be quite a havoc. So business of the future has to be no different from business of the past, who is facing tech, except that the past pre-digital, the tech was moving slower. With the digital tech is moving faster. So the disruption seem to be every four or five years uh, than compared to every 10, 20 years. So businesses don't have enough you know, time to readjust. So one thing they would have to be is that be you know, definitely um, be nimble about the adoption of technology rather than resisting. So they should adopt technology. They should be nimble enough to reimagine and sometimes they should be disrupted. It's hard to say that because it's very difficult for a company with the DNA, like, you know, you know, to disrupt themselves. It was easy for a phone pay to come from nowhere to disrupt something than an existing large bank or something. To do with. It's, it's always the case. But nevertheless, I think people do survive if they are smart enough to survive. But never write off technology, <laughs> never write off the speed at which it is disrupting and never write off people. Because when people find value, when the value gets unlocked in their life, they will not give up the technology. So companies have to look for value unlocking, not a venture capitalist increasing value. Society should unlock value through technology. When that happens, you can be a great businessman in between, in the middle of that. Nothing wrong. What a, what a profound note to end on. Pramod, really, really appreciate uh, being part of the podcast. It was a complete privilege and honor to have you on the podcast. Every Indian needs to know about Mr. Pramod Verma and the kind of impact that he has created. I wish you and, and the team the very best. And I hope that you will keep on creating impacts, which keeps on touching the lives of uh, every Indian, not just the every Indian, but the entire globe with now the Beckon Protocol. So really appreciate uh, and so for you taking time and being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Really appreciate this. Okay, bye.